Well, it's my joy to open the word with you this morning, continuing in 2 Corinthians. If you have your Bible, I would encourage you to open to chapter 11, verses 1 through 15. I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me, for I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel than the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Indeed, I consider that I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way, we have made this plain to you in all things. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone, for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. And what I am doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, their end will correspond to their deeds. This is the word of God. Would you pray with me? Our prayer and our plea is simple, Father. Show us Christ. Show us the Messiah. Show us Jesus, the one whom when anyone meets them, they are never the same. There are some with us this morning and some watching online that do not know Jesus and I pray, God, that you would reveal the Son to them. There are those of us here who, having known Christ for a long time, our hearts have grown dull and our eyes dim towards the beauty and the majesty and the sustaining joy of knowing Jesus. Would you restore it? Show us Christ. Show us Christ in the word today that will be preached by your servant, Trent. Strengthen and enable him to Show us Christ. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. When I am weak and weary from the storm In the valley and when the night is long Two messages for you today. The first one is honor your father and mother, especially your mother today. Well, we had the privilege yesterday of having, uh, last night, of having a, a little baby staying with us while his, the parents were out of town. And um, around somewhere between 1 and 2 p.m., that little baby uh, lifted, a.m., sorry, yes, 
uh, lifted his voice to the heavens and, uh, and woke me up. And I had two thoughts. One of them I can say out loud at church. It was, thank God for mothers. Because I rolled over and my wife was already in there taking care of this baby. And all I could think was, neither height nor depth nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come could ever separate me from my bed in this moment. (laughs) And she was already there caring for that baby. Thank God for mothers. Amen. (laughs) And for husbands and dads better than me who would be there to help. The second message is somewhat longer, but certainly as important. And it starts like this. We are all susceptible to being deceived. A great example of this comes from uh, the world of art and art museums. There's a man by the name of Mark Landis who for decades deceived many, many art museums into receiving pieces of art that he donated that are actually not real works of art. They are forgeries, copies that he himself made. And he was extraordinarily successful at doing this for a few reasons. First of all, he would disguise himself. He used aliases. He would sometimes dress himself up as a Jesuit priest so that when he came to present these works of art, people would not suspect anything about him. But when he uh, would step in there to do this, he had such an unusual personality by nature and an encyclopedic knowledge of art history that he genuinely came across as an eccentric art collector and philanthropist. He was very good at this. But that wouldn't have been enough in itself. What he actually had to offer were very legitimate looking copies of real art. He had an exceptional talent at being able to look at a piece of art, whether it was a religious icon or an impressionist or modernist painting, and using a pencil and paintbrush and a magnifying glass, he would carefully look at and study the the, the real work of art, and then he would draw his copy. And over 45 museums could not tell the difference between his copies and the real thing. And not only did he present these great-looking copies to them, not only did he play the part well of an actual philanthropist, but he knew exactly what to say when dealing with these art museum directors. He would tell them, that he has more works of art that he would be interested in donating and that he's considering giving some of the family estate to the museum in the form of endowment. One of the art museum directors interviewed said, he knew right where to hit us, our soft spot, art and money. He knew exactly what the art museum desperately wanted, which were more pieces of art and more money in order to facilitate the accomplishment of their mission as art museums, and that's how deceivers work. They know precisely where your soft spot is, where you're most inclined to be deceived and even ready to be deceived, and there they go to work. Satan is referred to in Scripture as the deceiver. He is the enemy of God's people from the beginning of humanity, and from the very beginning, he has been exceptionally talented at his work of deception and lies. In the Garden of Eden, at the beginning of humanity, our first parents, Adam and Eve, were deceived by him. Now consider this. Adam and Eve had no sinful nature to contend with. Adam and Eve actually lived with God in that garden. Adam and Eve lived in literal paradise, and yet still they were deceived. Do you think you're above being susceptible to deception? No. And who do you think are the easiest people to deceive? The very people who think they can't be deceived. D.A. Carson, talking about deception, says this, and it's an extended quote, but it's good, so 
Stay with me. He says, Christians are especially open to the kind of cunning deceit that combines the language of faith and religion with the content of self-interest and flattery. We like to be told how special we are, how wise, how blessed. We like to have our Christianity shaped less by the cross than by triumphalism or rules or charismatic leaders or subjective experience. And he says, if this shaping can be coded with assurances of orthodoxy, complete with cliche, we may not detect the presence of the arch deceiver, nor see that we are being weaned away from the sincere and pure devotion to Christ to, to a different gospel. That's precisely what's happening here in Corinth in our passage today. As Paul was away, these false apostles came into the church and began to flatter them and to deceive them. And what they were doing was undercutting the apostle Paul's authority and message to lead these Corinthians away from their devotion to the true Jesus to a false Jesus. And so Paul, knowing that this is happening, is speaking up to address that particular issue not so that he can win back their devotion to him, but he's jealous for their devotion to Jesus. It's Jesus' bride, not his, that he sees being deceived. And so as he does that, what we discover in this passage is this principle that will be our guide today, and that is because we're all susceptible to deception, we must remain devoted to Jesus and resist disguised deceivers. We must remain devoted to Jesus and resist disguised deceivers. So let's take the first part first. Because we're all susceptible to deception, we must remain devoted to Jesus. Paul begins this passage in verse one by asking them to bear with him as he's about to get foolish in their sight, and he's going to act that way for a couple of chapters here. He says, I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do, bear with me. For I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. So Paul is, is, is their spiritual father. He's the one who planted this church and introduced these people to Jesus. And he's speaking as a, a Jewish father who in that culture would have betrothed uh, their, his daughter to a spouse very early on in their life. And once that engagement was made, there was to be no breaking of it. There was to be no pursuing of other men. This was the man for you. And the father's role was to protect the integrity of that relationship and the integrity of that soon-to-be bride. And so Paul is using that language as he speaks to the church, and he's saying, when I came there and I preached the gospel to you and I introduced you to Christ, I betrothed you to him. And now I'm concerned that you are interested in some other lover than the one to whom you've been promised. You see, the way the scripture talks about Christ's relationship to his church is that Jesus is the groom and we collectively are the bride. And as we come to the end of history, this union with Jesus that we already experience by faith now is going to be fully consummated in all the glory of, of what the best of marriage can only give us a slight glimmer of. And Revelation 19 describes it this way, let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. That's the church. And that's the, the great celebration on the last day when the bride who has been betrothed is finally joined to Jesus Christ the groom and the, the fullness of all that that could mean. And now Paul's concerned that the bride has gotten eyes for another, not the one he betrothed them to. And so he speaks up. He says in verse three, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So he's pointing us back to that very first story in Genesis chapter three where Adam and Eve dwelling in the garden, the serpent slips in, who we come to discover later is Satan, the enemy of God's people. And he deceives Eve and then Adam. 
And they fall into this rebellion, this sinful rejection of God's rightful rule over their lives. And he says, I'm concerned that just as the serpent deceived Eve on that day, so he's now deceiving you. How did the serpent deceive Eve on that day? Well, he slipped in something of an unassuming way, a very non-threatening way. He, he didn't come in uh, spouting off his opposition to the God of the Bible, but he came just simply asking questions, ultimately undercutting the authority of the word of God that had been given to Adam and Eve that they were to keep. And he effectively seduced them away from faithfulness to God to embracing a lie. And Paul says, I see the same thing. I see you in Corinth at risk of doing the exact same thing, believing the lie of the deceiver, the serpent, betraying the one to whom you're betrothed and embracing this false lover. One commentator writes, Eve was not exonerated from her sin because she was taken in by the supreme trickster and neither will the Corinthians be exonerated. It's not difficult to deceive those who wish to be deceived. Their desires had already primed their own hearts to be disobedient. And so it is often for us. He knows where our soft spot is, where our desires are, where we're inclined to even want to be deceived and to take on a false Jesus rather than the one we've been betrothed to. And so he goes on in verse four and says, if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you ex accepted, you put up with it readily enough. These false apostles came bringing another gospel, another spirit, another Jesus. And the Corinthians were, were putting up with it. They were tolerating it. Now, that doesn't mean that they were coming in and preaching a message about Jesus Jones as opposed to Jesus Christ. That's not what he means by a different Jesus. They were preaching about Jesus of Nazareth, but they were preaching a message about Jesus of Nazareth that didn't line up with what the Gospels actually tell us about who Jesus of Nazareth is and what he came to do and what he did. They were preaching a gospel that they were calling the gospel, but it wasn't the same gospel that had been entrusted to the apostle Paul and the other apostles to be proclaimed throughout all the world. They were preaching about a spirit, but not the same Holy Spirit that the scripture describes to us. And the same thing goes on today. Ultimately, the Jesus who appeals to us is the Jesus that we believe answers the fundamental problem of humanity. Or to put it another way, whatever you believe the fundamental problem that we face as human beings is, that's the Jesus. The Jesus who answers that problem is the one that you're inclined to go after. And it may not be the same Jesus described in the Bible. As an example, in the first century, when Jesus actually came to the earth, the Jewish people were ex believed that their fundamental problem was Roman oppression. And they were expecting a Jesus who was going to come and throw off the shackles of the Romans, but that's not the Jesus of the Bible. And so they didn't recognize him when he came. And so what do you believe the fundamental problem of humanity is? Because that's the Jesus. The one who solves that problem is the one that you're going to be looking to. And it may not be the same Jesus described in the Bible. Let me give you a few examples of some of the Jesuses that we might be inclined to go after if we're not rock solid firm on what the actual fundamental problem with humanity is. These are just representative and they're somewhat caricatures, so don't be overly offended by any of them. First is socialist Jesus. Those people who believe that the fundamental problem of humanity is inequality will be inclined toward socialist Jesus. In their view, socialist Jesus came to bring an end to all inequality and inequity. Socialist Jesus doesn't have any love for the wealthy except for what the wealthy can do for the poor. Socialist Jesus came to earth to help facilitate class struggle and to ensure equal outcomes for all and to make sure that finally the rich and the poor will get what's coming to them. This is socialist Jesus. 
Now, there's a grain of truth here in this vision of Jesus, just as there is in each one of these alternative Jesus. That's what makes them compelling. When Jesus was on the earth, he taught us very clearly the dangers of money and the love of money particularly. And he warned the rich to make sure that they are taking care of and loving their poor neighbor. But this Jesus, the one described in the scripture, never promised that there would be equal outcomes for all people. In fact, not even in the new heavens and the new earth will there be equal outcomes for all people. There are some who will have more authority and responsibility than others, primarily because of what they did during their time here on earth. You can read about that in the Bible. You see, what the Jesus of Nazareth does is he actually changes the hearts of his people. So that no matter whether we have much or we have little, we become content with what we have. And what we do have, we offer freely and gladly to those who are in need. And that's the Jesus of Nazareth, the one of the Bible. A second Jesus is the nationalist Jesus. If you believe that the fundamental problem of humanity is tyrannical governments, whether foreign or domestic, and that the fundamental a threat to humanity is outsiders invading this nation. That the fundamental problem we have to overcome is government overreach into our personal and individual liberties. You might be inclined towards nationalist Jesus. Nationalist Jesus aims for America to be the greatest of all the nations upon the earth. And nationalist Jesus it tends to read the scriptural promises to Israel and to God's people as a whole as being specifically for America as a nation. A nationalist Jesus tends to equate loyalty to God with loyalty to country and to expect the same of everyone else. This is nationalist Jesus. Now, nationalist Jesus also has a point. See, there is a proper and appropriate love of one's country and of one's countrymen that we call patriotism. And this love of one's country and one's fellow countrymen enables us to come together as a people and to accomplish good things together in this world for good. It binds us in ways that create community and healthy relationships. But when that good love is perverted... Well, now country demands a loyalty and devotion that's due only to God himself. And in that way, it becomes corrupted in something less than what God has intended for his people. Whereas Jesus intends for us to increasingly love one another and our neighbor wherever they may be found, nationalist Jesus can Create a spirit of pride that actually drives division and tribalism contrary to the walls that the gospel aims to break down. That's nationalist Jesus. A third alternative to Jesus is prosperity Jesus. If you believe that humanity's fundamental problem is lack, whether it's a lack of, of resources in terms of money, whether it's a lack of fulfilling relationships, whether it's a lack of a career that satisfies the desires of your hearts, if, if, whether it's a, a lack of health. If you believe that the fundamental problem of humanity is lack, then you will be, then, then prosperity Jesus is going to appeal to you. Because prosperity Jesus came for you to have it all. Prosperity Jesus came so that the world could see how great he is by how great he makes you. Prosperity Jesus came to show how rich he is by making sure that you're driving the best cars, living in the best houses with designer sneakers on. Prosperity Jesus came to show his power by making sure that you don't experience weakness in this world. So if you believe that that our fundamental problem is lack and weakness, then prosperity Jesus is going to appeal to you. He's, he's offering to bring you out of these things. Now, prosperity Jesus has an element of truth as well, and it is that Jesus came proclaiming good news for the poor. 
Jesus came to give us life, and not just life, but life abundant. Jesus spent a great deal of his earthly ministry healing the sick, even raising the dead. Jesus promised that if we seek first the kingdom of God, then all of the rest is going to be added to us. That's all in there. That's true. That's the real Jesus. The corruption comes in this, that we come to see and to worship prosperity, Jesus, as the one who can satisfy all of our desires rather than worshiping him as the one who is the desire of our hearts. A fourth alternative to the biblical Jesus is progressive Jesus. If you believe that the fundamental problem of humanity is that antiquated cultural norms are being imposed upon you and that other people's moral framework is being imposed upon you, if you believe that the fundamental problem of humanity is that you're being restricted from self-actualization and expressing yourself as the individual that God intended you to be, then you will be inclined towards progressive Jesus. Because progressive Jesus... He doesn't believe you have a sin problem. Progressive Jesus comes to affirm you in your individuality, to, 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 to help you embrace your truth as you see it. And you don't need people to judge you, and you don't need a God to judge you. You need people who will celebrate and affirm you right where you are. That's what you need. Because the fundamental problem is not sin. It's these restrictions. Progressive Jesus will be found at the pride parade. He'll be found defending and standing with Planned Parenthood. Progressive Jesus will be found talking about the resurrection as a concept and an idea more than a historical reality. This is progressive Jesus. Progressive Jesus has a point in that sometimes we allow our traditions to override what the word actually says. We allow traditional values to actually speak louder than what the scripture says about how we think about things and what we approach, the way we approach issues in this world. But it's also dead wrong. Do you see the thread here? Depending on what you believe the fundamental problem of humanity is, you will be drawn to a Jesus who addresses that particular issue. If you think that the fundamental problem we have as a society is that, is that, is that liberals are throwing off our Judeo-Christian values, then you'll be inclined toward a Jesus that will help you own the libs rather than one who will help you love. And listen and treat with respect. If you believe that the fundamental problem is that people are trampling on your individual rights and asking you to lay down your rights and to think about others ahead of yourself, you might be inclined to embrace the Jesus who's waving the don't tread on me flag rather than the one who says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. If you believe that the fundamental problem of humanity is white supremacy, if you believe that the fundamental problem of humanity is poverty, if you believe that the fundamental problem of humanity is conservatism, or depending on what you think the fundamental problem is, is the Jesus that you're going to run toward, and it's not going to be the Jesus of the Bible. What is the fundamental problem of humanity? The fundamental problem of humanity is that we have been separated from God because of our sin, and we as a people are rightly under his wrath and curse, and we are facing the judgment. That's the fundamental problem of humanity, is that you are a rebel against God, and that his judgment is coming. And until you are reconciled to him, All of these other things are going to keep being issues. You see, all of the things that we've been talking about, inequality, unbiblical ways of thinking about morality, 
uh, envying others. All of these things are symptoms of the problem, but they're not the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is your rebellion against God. Your sin is the fundamental problem. And if your sin is the fundamental problem, then there is only one Jesus who can answer that problem. There's only one Jesus who was God and became man and came to this earth to die on a cross in your place, bearing the consequences of your sin in his own body on the tree. There's only one Jesus who rose again from the dead on the third day so that all who have put their trust in him will also overcome death and reign with him in a new heavens and a new earth forever. There's only one Jesus who can transform your life and take you from being an an envious and and miserable and hateful person to being a person marked by love and compassion and mercy and justice. That's the Jesus of the Bible. And the good news about this Jesus, he's for everybody. You don't have to be from a particular country. You don't have to have a particular political persuasion. You don't have to have a particular background. You don't have to be any kind of anything. He says, whoever comes, whoever will come, come. Come. The good news is that your fundamental problem has been addressed by the true Jesus. And we want you to know him. And we want you to remain faithful to him. And here's the thing. Once we're clear on what the fundamental problem is, now we can come at all of the other issues, all of the symptoms of the other problems. We can come to them with a gospel perspective and begin to speak to the issues that face our culture and society and us as individuals and people. Now, Christians might disagree on some of the implications of how the gospel speaks into these issues, but we share a common ground in understanding what the fundamental problem is. But if you start by trying to address one of these secondary problems as the fundamental problem, that is an Endeavor bound to fail. So what's, what am I getting at here? Here's what I'm getting at. You come here on Sunday morning and you spend somewhere between an hour and 15 minutes to an hour and a half, depending on how winded I get. <laughs> and you hear the truth about the fundamental problem of humanity and God's solution for it in Jesus Christ. But I and we are not your chief disciplers. Your chief disciplers are the people that you're listening to on TV and that you're reading on social media. Those are the voices that are doing the most shaping of you. And every one of those voices is telling you what the fundamental problem of humanity is. And most of them are not saying that the fundamental problem is our sin and separation from God and that the solution is Jesus. They're telling you something else. And when you listen to it over and over and over and enough, and you just keep flipping from one to the next, and you hear these voices, you start to believe that humanity's fundamental problem is the left or the right, as the case may be. That humanity's fundamental problem is is what these black people are doing in the cities, or that humanity's fundamental problem is what these white people are doing in the suburbs, or that the humanity's fundamental problem is the, the growing disparity in the rich and the poor. You come to start believing that these are our fundamental problem instead of the symptom of the problem, and so you start to look for a different Jesus than the one offered in the scripture. And my heart and our heart is jealous for you to remain faithful to this one. And so beware and be conscious of what you're taking in. And for most of you, be intentional to take in less. You know the news isn't there to inform you, it's there to shape you, and it is. So make sure you're being shaped by the truth. Make sure that the Jesus you're longing for is the one who's actually described in the scripture who comes to answer the problem our fundamental problem. Remain faithful to him. Secondly, we must resist disguised deceivers. If somebody comes to your door and says, hey, I'm here to ruin your life, destroy you and your family and everybody you love, <laughs> you probably see them coming, right? 
But if they come and say, hey, I'm here for you. I'm here to support you. I care about the things you care about. We have shared vision and goals, and I wanna help you and serve you and love you. You're probably going to be a lot more inclined to be taken in by such a person. Well, Paul says that's basically the way that deceivers come to us. They don't come making war on us. They come as our friends. They come dressed as angels of light. And so we have to be on guard and ready to recognize disguised deceivers. Just a couple of tips on recognizing disguised deceivers. First of all, disguised deceivers sometimes dazzle with style so you disregard substance. That's what the deceivers were doing in Corinth. They were exceptionally gifted in their rhetorical abilities. They could speak really well, and they, they spoke in a way that particularly appealed to the Corinthians, who were thoroughly Greek. And Paul didn't. And they made much of the fact that Paul didn't speak as well as them. And so they caused the people to not be as concerned about the message those false apostles were saying because they were taken by how well they were saying it. And so Paul has to defend himself. He says in verse five, indeed, I consider I'm not in the least inferior to these super apostles. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, which in Greek actually says, even if I'm an idiot in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way we have made this plain to you in all things. Paul says, maybe I don't speak as well as them. I, and, and, and intentionally so, he doesn't. He tells us in 1 Corinthians. He says, but I'm not unskilled in knowledge. I know the truth, and that's what I'm delivering to you. And you're buying into a lie because of the way they're selling it to you. Well, people from then till now are still captivated by good speakers. The definition of what that means has changed over time, but, but we're still more inclined to be dazzled with how somebody says something than what they're actually saying. And this is the great weapon of many deceivers. One early satirist in the second century was talking about how to be the kind of speaker that gets a great following. And I believe that this person must still be being read today because if you listen to the talking heads and, and commentators and a lot of those people who take those videos of themselves sitting in their car that go viral on Facebook, you know, because they're fired up and mad, I feel like these people, they're all reading right out of Lucian's advice. This is what he says. He says, the traits that you should possess in particular are these. You should be impudent and bold and should abuse all and each, both kings and commoners, for thus they will admire you and think you manly. Let your language be barbarous like the barking of a dog. In a word, let everything about you be bestial and savage. Put off modesty, decency, and moderation. Wipe away blushes from your face completely. This road is a shortcut to fame. Whatever you say, just say it blusterly and loudly and madly and abuse everybody and then... People will love you. They will think you are manly. And they may not even pay attention to what you're saying and how it lines up with the scripture. Watch out that you not be taken in and dazzled by the way someone is saying something and not pay attention to the substance of what they're saying and if it actually lines up with the truth of scripture. Secondly, Disguised deceivers frequently lure sheep away from faithful shepherds so you have no defense. This is what the deceivers are doing. They've come in, they've undercut Paul's authority, and the way they did it was really impressive. They took something that Paul intended for good and they flipped it upside down and made it look like something bad. And deceivers still do that. They aim to undercut the authority of the shepherds who know and love you by taking good things and turning them upside down as though they're bad things to lure you away where now you are all alone and not under the care of shepherds anymore. So here's how they did it. They took the fact that Paul didn't charge them any money for his message and they said, this is evidence of one of two things. His message is worthless and that's why he's not charging you. Or two, he's not charging you because he doesn't love you. He's willing to let other churches support him, but he won't let you because he doesn't care about you. 
Here's what Paul says in verse seven. Did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I didn't burden anyone for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way as the truth of Christ is in me. This boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I don't love you? God knows I do. I didn't accept money from you because I didn't want anything to stand between you and Jesus. And so I robbed other churches. I had other people support me while I was doing my ministry here so that nothing would stand in the way of you and the gospel. Because I didn't love you? My goodness, what's wrong with you people? See, but the deceivers had gotten in and they had turned this good thing into a bad thing. And so having done that now, they were inclined to listen to the lies and the false Jesuses that they were presenting. And they're still doing this. And Paul says about such people in verse 13, such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Paul knows there's a day of judgment coming for those who seek to undermine the authority of faithful shepherds in order to lure the sheep away and deceive them. That's serious. Charles Hodge says, Satan doesn't come to us as Satan, neither does sin present itself as sin, but in the guise of virtue. And the teachers of error set themselves forth as the special advocates of truth. That's what they do. They come to you as those who have the corner on what's true. And they say to you, your shepherds may be saying this, they may be telling you this, but they're deceived. Here's the truth that only I'm telling you. You don't know them. You see, how do these deceivers work today? They don't actually come into the church per per se as they had to do then. How do the deceivers come to you? They come to you through social media particularly. Right into your home. They don't have to come through us. They just come right there. And what do they say? They say things like this. If your pastor doesn't feel exactly the way I feel about this particular issue of the moment then you need to leave that church and go find one where they feel like I feel. If your pastor and your elders aren't dealing with this pandemic in the way that I think they ought to deal with this pandemic, even though you don't know me from Adam, you ought to leave that church and go find a church that preaches the truth. If your pastor's not dealing with the the current cultural issue and speaking out about the racial issues in the way that I think they ought to be speaking out about them right now in this moment, then you need to leave that church and go find a place that does. If your pastor's not speaking out about the vaccine one way or the other, my view, then you need to go find a place where that pastor's not already taken the mark of the beast and can be trusted. You see, these aren't theoretical examples. People from right here have listened to these voices and said, you're right. I need to leave and I need to go find a place where they're gonna preach the truth. I don't trust them. They've left. It breaks our hearts as shepherds. Because those are all secondary or maybe tertiary issues. And what we aim to do here on Sunday morning and throughout the week is is we aim to keep your eyes focused on the, the fundamental problem, which is your separation from God because of sin, and the fundamental solution, which is Jesus. And only from that place do we begin to work out those other issues and agree that Christians can disagree on, on how we approach these different things. Once we've agreed on what the fundamental thing is, and because nobody's telling you through the week what the fundamental problem is, we're making that our focus and have and will. Because you need to be reminded so that when the alternative Jesuses are presented to you, you don't go running after them. But you keep running to the one who came and died and rose again for you and will come again and will deal with all of the deceivers when he comes. 
Paul was jealous for the church, not for himself, but for Jesus. And if Paul was jealous for the church, you can be sure that God is jealous for the church. He is jealous that Christ will have the prize for which he died, his bride, spotless and pure. You. And you and I, we, we're susceptible to deception. We've already said it, but I want you to take heart in this. Jesus doesn't give up his bride. He's going to have you. You're going to be presented to him on that last day, and your call is to remain faithful, to watch out and resist those deceivers, but stay faithful to the one who holds you in his hand and will not let you go. Let's keep our eyes on this Jesus, and let's resist those deceivers, and let's look forward to that grand and great celebration on that day when he comes, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Would you pray with me to that end? We thank you, Lord, that you love us enough to tell us the truth and to record it in the scriptures, the word of God that endures forever. As cultures change and issues change and things rise and fall, your word stands forever. Lord, help us to be a congregation and a people who keep the main thing the main thing, who are not sucked in to the secondary matters and so sucked away from you in this primary matter. But may we remain faithful to the truth of the gospel and then, and then may we bring the truth of the gospel to bear on the various strongholds, the arguments, the opinions raised against the true knowledge of God. May we bring that truth to bear in a way that glorifies you in this world, that loves you and loves our neighbor. We thank you that you are keeping us, and we pray that your spirit, who has sealed us, will also work in us to help us to resist temptation and to stay faithful until the end. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.